I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello listeners, this is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, onto the episode. All right. Hello, Elise. Hi, Corey. How are you doing today? Doing pretty well. Very excited about today's topic. I am as well. Would you like to announce what we're talking about today? Oh, sure. I'm very excited to talk about our topic today, uh, which is tyranny and treason. Tyranny and treason in Macbeth. And tyranny and treason is a really relevant thing if you were paying attention to what was happening in the early part of January 2021 in the United States of America. We are recording this at the end of January 2021. We chose this topic before January 2021. So would you look at that? <laughs> would you look at that? <laughs> and this topic is also quite present in Macbeth. So let's get into it. Yeah. So before we get started in the conversation, I do just want to note how many times certain words are used within the text. 
Within Macbeth, the word traitor is used eight times in the play. The word treason is used six times. Tyrant is used 15 times. And the word tyranny is only used three. But with, you know, Macbeth as the shortest play in Shakespeare's canon of tragedies, I would say that makes it a pretty relevant thing to discuss. That's a lot of tyrant. (laughs) A lot of tyrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure we can all guess who that word is directed towards. I think it's the title character, right? I would definitely say so. So uh, what is a tyrant? A tyrant is, according to Google Dictionary, a cruel and oppressive ruler. And the definition of tyrant that we use today is different from the origins. It is Greek. And tyrannical rule of ancient Greece was a person who came to rule outside the normal, acceptable, understood way in which a person could come to power. So basically, like, you just aren't legitimately in power. So there was this idea that you could be a good tyrant or a bad tyrant. It wasn't exclusively bad. But by the time Shakespeare was writing, tyrant came to mean bad. Totally bad. Cool. And actually... It is interesting because there are certain historical figures from modern history who, while they're not necessarily, you know, in the same positions of power, there are certain historical figures who you can look at today and go, oh, their reputation is very much like Macbeth, the tyrant. But can you guess who I'm going to talk about? Uh, Did I tell you? I don't know. (laughs) No? Okay. Okay. So um, I actually stumbled upon this really fascinating read called Hitler, Stalin, and Shakespeare's Macbeth. Modern Totalitarianism and Ancient Tyranny by Roland Mouchat Fry. And essentially, even though Shakespeare was writing 300 years before totalitarianism that grew out of, you know, the 1900s, it's incredibly surprising that the language describing the fictional tyrant Macbeth is similar to the described personalities of both Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Uh, Fry frames his article by referencing the 1992 Economist article entitled Explaining the Unthinkable with a quote. The central tormenting and overwhelming question, how could a civilized nation sink to such bestiality? And it basically concluded that, quote, how a whole nation can be selected for annihilation will probably haunt the world for many years to come, unquote. And that analysis is in relation to, like, modern totalitarianism, but I think that's also a theme in medieval Macbeth. This idea of a whole nation, Scotland, yeah. under Macbeth. If you still have Macbeth in power, the nation of Scotland will be no more. And his rule is going to end up affecting everything that happens in Scotland for generations to come. Yeah, that's that's a lot of mm-hmm. like Macduff's argument when he goes to see... When Malcolm asks, like, how does our fair country and Macduff is like, it's almost a shame to know itself. It weeps, it bleeds, and... You know, each day there's more horrors and it's completely downfallen, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Quote, alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself, unquote. By Act 4, Macbeth has no regard for the consequences and the wide-scale global sacrifices of his selfishness and his tyranny. So there's language that raises the fear of a tyrant destroying a nation. And so now that I have framed the state of Scotland, much like, you know, the classified totalitarian states, uh, I want to look at how, according to Fry, Macbeth, our fictional character from, you know, 1606 England, is described in many ways like Stalin and Hitler. Uh, so this is going to be a little jumbled going Give in order of points. just... Okay. So Macbeth resembles Stalin because he and Stalin both ridicule and browbeat people as a tactic to assert authority. Like, there have been multiple recountings of Stalin hosting Soviet parties from like 10 at night until four in the morning. And basically at these parties, he would bully and browbeat people and get them drunk as a skunk. And then he would bully them into uh, doing whatever it is that he wanted, anything that would entertain him. And um, it would humiliate his guests, you know? So that's fun. (laughs) Um, But Uh, Yeah, Macbeth is similar in that he ridicules and browbeats his inner circle. And you see that in Act 5 when he is, um, when he has one of his servants come in and his servant is trying to dress him and getting him ready to go, ready for battle. And then Macbeth ends up berating him and like calling him like lily livered and um, um, way face. mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 By a certain point, Macbeth's only real technique for asserting authority over anyone is just to 
browbeat them and ridicule them. And that's exactly what Stalin was said to do. Uh, So this next one is something that connects Macbeth to both Stalin and Hitler. And that's tragic female figures in their lives. Uh, So let's start with Stalin. Uh, Stalin's wife, Nadezhda, was found in her bedroom after being ridiculed by her husband, quote, dead from a self-inflicted bullet shot, unquote. The story goes that she was embarrassed by her brutish, crude husband, and that's why she ended up killing herself. And um, who does that remind you of? A little bit. Lady M. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get to Hitler's female figure, here's another comparison to Stalin about uh, the last days of their lives. So Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, said in an interview with the New York Times in 1953 about her father, quote, he was gradually ruining himself, and there came in the last days of his life the complete loneliness, unhappiness, disappointment in everybody around him, disbelief, suspicion, and the condition one can even call the mania of persecution, unquote. So, if you go back to Macbeth, uh, he says of his life, quote, My way of life is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have. But in their stead, curses not loud but deep, mouth honor breath, which the poor heart would fain deny and dare, unquote. Both men, towards the end of their lives, seem to have the same feeling of emptiness that they can't fill. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, Soviet historian Roy Medvedes says that, quote, having wiped out almost all his erstwhile friends and comrades, Stalin had good reason to be afraid of people. This fear steadily increased throughout his life. Stalin's fear of exposure and retribution drove him to commit more and more crimes, unquote. And when we analyze Macbeth, did he start out as a paranoid person who would just kill people for no reason? No. But what did he become by the time we get to Act 5? Super paranoid and killing people for no reason. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and uh, one last thing that connects Macbeth and Stalin that I was like, oh, no. Uh, there was this thing called the Great Terror, the cleansing in the 1930s. And basically the idea was that Whenever a high Bolshevik fell in one of Stalin's purges, both his personal family and his official family of political clients suffered with him. And when Macbeth is very like, I gotta wipe out Macduff, it's not just Macduff that ends up getting wiped out. It's- his wife, his children, he even says like the serv- like everyone who is even distantly related to Macduff, there will be no more Macduffs on this earth. Um, mm-hmm. All others yeah. who trace him in his line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now let's move on to how Macbeth resembles Hitler. Hitler was described by historian Desmond Seward as having a, quote, Janus like character, one charming and kind, one diabolical and evil, unquote. Macbeth is also two faced, saying one thing to Duncan and Banquo and another to Lady Macbeth or to the audience when he is delivering a soliloquy. Yeah. Uh, like Macbeth specifically talks about mm-hmm. like wearing two faces, making. Or making our fates, like, not mm-hmm. show what we truly are inside. Mm. It's like, quote, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent underneath it, unquote. But also, quote, false face must hide what the false heart doth know, unquote. We must make our faces wizards or masks to our hearts, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Alan Bullock, who is another historian, uh, he says that Hitler and Stalin were both able to disguise from allies as well as opponents their thoughts and their intentions. And that's exactly like what Macbeth and Lady Macbeth do. Yeah, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, but now I want to go back a little bit to something that I said um, is common with both Macbeth, Stalin, and Hitler and discuss Hitler's side to it. So Hitler also had a close woman in his life, his niece, Gelly, who he was infatuated with. uh, And on one night after an argument, uh, it said that she shut herself in her room, and around midnight she ended her life with a pistol shot in the heart. Quote, Hitler had driven her to death by his vicious rages, and by an infatuation which could not be resolved in any normal way. Unquote. Again, a connection to Lady Macbeth. Yeah. So bo- both and- of these actual historical men, and then our fictional character, have women in their lives who support them, and then they get to a point where they just start ignoring them, and then the woman dies by her own means. 
um, both Hitler and Stalin, they were said to have been just brutish towards these women. And uh, the only way they thought that they could deal with it was to end their own lives. It's fascinating to me that both of these men who existed 300 years later share with our fictional character a woman figure in their lives who they neglect the woman so badly that it ends with her death. And in both cases, it's not just their death, it's their suicide. They all chose. In all three. All three have chosen to. Yep. They've all chosen to end their own lives. In all three. All three. Uh, Here's another. Hitler also, uh, his true original program was called Weltmacht oder Niedergang, which is world power or ruin. And uh, British chronicler Hugh Trevor Roper wrote, quote, if world power was unattainable, it was agreed by all who knew him. He would make the ruin as great as he could and himself perish in the cataclysm of his own making, unquote. And uh, who do we happen to know who at the end of their life is like, hmm, well, if things aren't going to go my way, I'm going to blow up everything along with myself. Blow wind come rack, at least I'll die with harness on my back, right? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet or to be baited with the rabble's curse. Like, mm. Yeah. And, uh, and there's one last similarity I want to discuss. At the end of Macbeth's life, he shares something with Hitler and Napoleon Bonaparte as well, uh, this author notes. But Macbeth's final scene with Macduff turns the captured Macbeth into a monstrous exhibition for public derision possibly referring to the long-standing English freak shows and displays at fairs. And Hitler and Napoleon similarly feared this kind of public exhibition to like, you know, he doesn't want he doesn't fight. want to be paraded as a yeah. Yeah. Hitler and Napoleon similarly feared this exhibition. Although unlike the beheaded Macbeth, both of them, uh, Hitler and Napoleon would have been alive when this exhibition happened. It would have been like they were animals in a zoo or a show trial staged by Jews was what Hitler feared. But like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But the point being is that all three of these figures, if we include Napoleon in this in this conversation, feared they would be paraded as, you know, tyrants and mocked and ridiculed because of the consequences of their actions. And they did not want to be turned into an exhibit. Mm. So Macbeth shares these very like, uh, incredibly distinct characteristics with these two historical figures from modern history and all of this doesn't necessarily relate to Macbeth in terms of how the play was made or why it was made but it's like you can see it in the text from Macbeth this idea that Shakespeare had about what it means to be a tyrant what are the qualities of a tyrant yeah and now that we have discussed the uh characteristics of a tyrant Uh, Now would be a great time to uh, discuss what was, during Shakespeare's time, a proper or conventional form of dealing punishment. punishment. I think it's fascinating that these three men were so terrified of the same thing that Macbeth fights to the death to avoid, which is public ridicule. So some things maybe haven't changed since Shakespeare's time. So... When we talk about law and order in early modern England and tyranny and treason, there actually weren't any successful treasons between the War of the Roses and 1649. Hmm. Instead, the entirety of what is treason was a lot of what might have happened instead. Because 1649 would have been the beheading of Charles, the end of the British Renaissance. Yes. Yes. So, 1352, Edward III defined treason as harm done to the monarch's body. So, this meant, like, one, actually killing. It also extended to other physical assaults, such as making war, counterfeiting, and rape. Hmm. Counterfeiting and rape are considered an assault on reproductions of the monarch, because mm-hmm. legal tender has the face of the monarch on it, and if you are counterfeiting the monarch's image, then... Uh, that is uh, treasonous. So that would have been more like rape of, say, a queen. And it's like, she's not having her rape being taken seriously as an individual, but because by proxy, you are property of the king. And that is why we are going yeah. to, okay, I, I just wanted to make sure. So, so <laughs> yes. So, yes, um, <laughs> you can be charged for treason for raping the king's consort or eldest unmarried daughter because you are wounding the potential heir. More than the woman. 
Okay, yeah, so like within Shakespeare's time, you couldn't be charged with rape just of any woman. It would have been specifically geared towards the king. There's a little bit more to this. Okay. Um, this specific statute gets redefined and repealed okay. and edited. But prior to King Henry VIII, that's what treason was. It was specific physical harm against the king or reproduction of the king. Got it. It does not condemn attempts or to wound or depose the monarch. There was actually like a lot of freedom of speech. You know, you can say, I don't like the king, for example. Okay. But in 1534, Henry VIII created a statute that included treason by words. And it reads, If any person or persons, after the first day of February next coming, do maliciously wish, will, or desire by words or writing, or by craft, imagine, invent, practice, or attempt any bodily harm to be done or committed to the king's most royal person, the queen's or their heirs apparent, or to deprive them or any of them of the dignity, title, or name of their royal estates, or slanderously and maliciously publish and pronounce by express writing or words that the king, our sovereign lord, should be heretic, schismatic, tyrant, infidel, or usurper of the crown, then every such person and person so offending in any premises after the said first day of February, their aiders, counselors, consenters, and abettors, being thereof lawfully convicted according to the laws and customs of this realm, shall be committed or done after the said first day of February shall be reputed, accepted, and adjudged high treason. Whew. So. So basically you just cannot, uh, you cannot call the king so now, illegitimate? Or... You can't say or write it. Ah. Okay. Yep. It is, it is illegal to say that the king should not be the king. Um, and this is largely written after the split with Ro- Henry VIII's split with Rome. So mm. to crack down on Catholics, the Catholics, who may be saying that he's no longer, or maybe the queen even, are mm-hmm. no longer valid monarchs. So um, again, we have almost 200 years. Treason is just an action. 1534, now you can't even say it or write it. In 1547, Henry's son, Edward VI, repeals it for a treason act that was more like the original 1352 rules. Then Elizabeth I in 1571 brought back language as a form of treason, writing that treason would have occurred if a subject wrote it, printed it, preached it, said it, expressed it, maliciously, advisedly published, set forth. So this just became more specific than any type okay. of words writing. It included, like, intent. And this remained until 1628. Okay. Great. Yeah. Nice job, Elizabeth. Woo! Right? Um, sometimes, so... sometimes I just learn these things that I never knew about her, and I'm just like, all right, Elizabeth. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, during this time, so all this discussion about what treason is is coming in a world where treason's not actually successfully happening. It's not in reaction to that. It's a reaction to the possibility of what could have happened. So it's just a fantasy. It's just like in our, in the worst case scenario, this is what could happen, would happen. It has nothing to do with actual success. It's just... It's it's in these in these trials. Let's try to like convince the jury and the judge of what the plan was and how devastating it could have been. Mm-hmm. Because there's no actual proof. It becomes he said, she said. Right. Because the actual treason doesn't occur. It's just caught in the planning stages. And while Shakespeare was writing, his country was super concerned about the state of the queen's health. And there was all of this like religious settlement stuff, the distribution of wealth, foreign relations, the possibility of civil war. And it honestly seems like it's the perfect opportunity for the state to take advantage of the general fear of uprisings because... Yeah, and I think that's what it is, is that, like, Mm -hmm. there are uprisings. They don't actually get to a point of treason, but -hmm. let's make sure that we very clearly state what is treason so that the crown is protected. Yeah, I have a couple of those. Like, I'm sure there were more, but there are... uh, But there are the big popular well-known plots of treason, like the gunpowder plot, you know? Uh, the one that inspires Mm -hmm. Macbeth to write or (laughs) inspires Shakespeare to write Macbeth. And then there's the Essex Rebellion that we talked about in the intro series. There was also a plot in 1586 involving a wealthy 24-year-old Catholic man named Anthony Babington who, with a group of like-minded friends, 
persuaded himself that it was morally acceptable to kill the quote-unquote tyrant, who would have been Elizabeth at the time. So, you know, we have talked about James being incredibly paranoid about assassination attempts because he was not popular. Elizabeth was also, like, I wouldn't say equally uh, subject to... uh, There wasn't an equal desire to, like, kill her compared to James. But, like, people wanted to kill her. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, like, we've discovered a plot. The plot doesn't actually succeed. But we find out that people are plotting, and then we try them for thinking and planning this Mm -hmm. idea. In addition to the ones that you already mentioned, there was also a plot against King James by the Earl of Gowrie. The Earl of Gowrie attempted to murder King James while James was staying at the Earl's house in Perth. That's why I say, like, there was no successful... No king, no monarch in early modern England actually died because of treason. So all they had was trying traitors based on, like, if this had succeeded, here's how bad it would have been. Mm-hmm. The crime wasn't actually committed, so they had to make the crime, the thinking, the writing, suggesting someone does it. Yeah, yeah. A- and it's cool that Shakespeare in his plays, he does grapple with, you know, a lot of these things that people would have been thinking about, which is like, what is like, like thought crime, you know, crimes for, I don't know if that's technically a term, but like, you know, that's 1984 George yes. Orwell, but yeah, George, that's, yeah. that's, that's very that's much basically. what we're talking about here is, yeah. What is can you get crime? in trouble for depending on the thoughts that you have, even if you don't actually execute anything. And uh, that would have been a reason to try someone for treason, right? Yeah. Like father Henry Garnet, right? He wasn't actually, and we talk about this in our episode on the gunpowder plot, Mm -hmm. he wasn't actually involved in the planning of it, but because he was a known Catholic priest, they could suggest that he preached about ideas that led these men and that he was this equivocator, that what he was saying, because he was equivocating, was suggesting did eventually lead the gunpowder plotters to... Buy a bunch of gunpowder and... A- yeah, almost blow up Parliament. And this would have been similar to the concept of, like, in the 90s when the media said Marilyn Manson was part of the inspiration for the Columbine shooting and blamed him. And it's like, no, you can't try to charge him for something that two other people did. Uh, but this is like the... But in, in Shakespeare's but time. in early modern England... Yeah. Mm-hmm. In early modern England, you could 100% if you were mm-hmm. found to be discussed it with them and not, you know, turned them in. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then when you when you were tried and found guilty of treason, you were publicly hanged. Yes, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Yes. Once you were found guilty and when you were set to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, it gave rise to this genre of kind of performance known as the scaffold speech at the People scaffold. People knew about it. Yeah, yeah, they knew about it and they'd be like, are you going to the hanging of Guy Fox?" hell yeah, I am. Let's pop some popcorn and off we go. Right. Yeah. And it became a quote unquote show. And these scaffold speeches served as instruction for the audience on how to avoid doing similar crimes, how to avoid these crimes and punishment, and then telling them directly, like, don't engage in criminal activity and this Mm -hmm. won't happen to you. They also worked in place of Catholic confession in this super Protestant world. So confession was abolished by Elizabeth I in 1563. But these speeches allowed for a secular version that allowed the sinner to be forgiven. Private confessions became this very theatricalized production. Mm. And there was plenty of reason to do them because there were a lot of external pressures to do them and do them well. Basically, there was like this formula that you plugged in. Is it kind of like when a person is like, oh my gosh, I made a snafu and I have to uh, to go give my apology, my PR thing. I have to say all the right things. Yeah, let me write this in my notes app and post it on Instagram. Okay. Yes. All and right. we see this kind of structure <laughs> show up uh, in the scaffold speeches of traitors who are associated with the Babington plot, the Essex Rebellion, and the gunpowder plot. So they acknowledge mm. the merciful monarch. They mm-hmm. confess their wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. There's a validation of the punishment as just, and then they offer a prayer for the monarch. These speeches, because they justified the crown's punishment, they were then used as propaganda 
and mm-hmm. printed with the monarch's express permission and circulated in pamphlets that narrated the events from arraignment from like trial to execution so your true crime documentary uh-huh. of the late 1500s <laughs> early 1600s were these pamphlets <laughs> that described how the traitors were dealt with and pamphlet authors would occasionally question the sincerity of the speeches due to this formulaic right. uh, way of doing them and they would suggest and some sometimes the authors would may they would may they have fabricated stuff? ah i see they may have changed stuff or or made the dying words a little bit better because mm-hmm. there was pressure to justify what the crown had chosen to do. Right, because there was a there there was a I remember reading there was this sort of in some ways in some ways this propaganda that was an indication of the weakening of the monarch itself. And so in order to strengthen the monarchy and the legitimacy of the monarchy, if anyone is charged with treason, you have to make darn to ensure that it was a really good reason why these people were put to death. Yeah. Yeah. For example, there's this pamphlet that recounts the scaffold speech of Henry Cuff, who was executed in March 1601 for his role in the Essex Rebellion. And it simultaneously condemns the prisoner for refusing to repent and then reports that the final words were like exactly hitting that rubric of all the things that a good scaffold speech. Well, and of course, and like, and and I guess in a, with the gunpowder traders, uh, there's this source, T.W., an anonymous spectator at the gunpowder traders execution and uh who who said that like neither robert winter nor robert keys voiced any particular penance and ambrose rookward yeah. prayed on the scaffold for king james's conversion to catholicism which... and, so, and there's a pamphlet and i don't know if uh-huh. it's the same i don't know if we're talking about the same author because my reading didn't get into the anonymous author mm. but an anonymous author of a pamphlet about the gunpowder plot also reports that they all had no remorse but it also states that on the scaffold to ask for forgiveness of God, the king, and the kingdom. So the formula was drilled in because the pamphleteers had this pressure to justify what the crown did. Right. But prisoners would have used this formula. For example, like there was a lot of economic pressure to do so. If you are found guilty of treason, your estate would be forfeited to the crown. And when women married they forfeited whatever they'd inherited from their family into that became absorbed into the husband's estate. I see. But upon confession or your scaffold speech, the crown could be merciful and decide to return the wife's portion back to her and her family if the treasonous husband did a real A plus job on confessing. So that so this is like well, not totally related to but it kind of just reminds me of in Richard II, which, and this would be a monarch abusing this power when, uh, but when the crown confiscated all of John Gaunt's possessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just the idea of the monarch finding reasons to take their subject's property for whatever reason, you know, it's not a completely perfect parallel because I think uh, Shakespeare would have gotten in trouble maybe for being critical of Elizabeth or James, but, uh, when looking at Richard, Richard is not shown in a good light, but just this idea of like legitimizing the confiscation of subjects uh, of subjects' possessions. But then, if the crown does that thing, which is totally like say that it's legitimate, why you were being executed for treason, and then you're going to get a little bit back so that your family doesn't suffer. Exactly. Okay. Because of the formulaic nature, there's definitely a lot of doubt. <laughs> there's some direct quotes that I have. Uh huh. Of contemporaries of these times, throwing shade. Great, bring it on. For example, an anonymous author in 1606 reported that Sir Edward Coke said at the arraignment of the gunpowder traders, "Quote: True repentance is indeed never too late, but late repentance is seldom found true." Oh. So, uh huh. <laughs> confessing right before your death, probably, probably a not a real yeah. <laughs> and then back to Ambrose Rookwood. Uh-huh. In a pamphlet entitled The Arraignment and Execution of the Late Traitors, that was circulated after the gunpowder plot, the author claimed that Ambrose, out of a studied speech, would fain have made his bringing up and breeding in idolatry to have been some excuse to his villainy, but a fair talk could not help a foul deed. Foul and fair. Fair. Fair talk and a foul deed. And this was 1606. So this was before the play is written. Uh-huh. Huh? 
So this would be right about the time. Right about the time it was being created. Uh So there's this idea of foul and fair. Also the idea of studied speech. And one reason why I want to talk about scaffold speeches is because we do hear about one in the play. Malcolm comes in in 1-4 and Duncan asks, you know, is execution done on Cawdor, the original Cawdor who rose up against Duncan? Mm Mm-hmm. And Malcolm says that he died as one that had been studied in his death, Mm. and nothing became his life like the leaving of it. This suggests that the speech is a little bit more like a memorized monologue delivered by an actor than a true confession. Yeah. It's an interesting contrast to, like, Macbeth's final speech, where he says he's not going to yield to Malcolm. No. And instead, whoever stops the fight should be damned to hell. And that original thing of Cawdor, death, scaffold speech, can be seen as foreshadowing for Macbeth. Mm-hmm. And it can also be interpreted as a failure of of this like genre of scaffold speech. Because if a scaffold speech is supposed to instruct the people who hear about it to not do the thing that the speaker did, it fails spectacularly because yeah. Macbeth gets a model and a namesake instead of yes um Ste- learning a lesson away. and steering away from it yeah 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 well and then we have one other uh we have one other traitor but that would be mcdonwald he was also a traitor but he doesn't even get to do a scaffold speech because he just gets you know killed from the nave to the chops In so battle. you have three different versions of like what can happen to a traitor within Macbeth. yeah it's also interesting to consider like how duncan is like so bad at reading the room Mm -hmm. when it comes to law of his land so he talks about harmonious state but he's just been at war he Mm -hmm. has to rely on thanes his sons to report he's not leading the troops he's not on the front line he's sitting back in his camp um he's not even like at the execution he has to ask somebody to like report report what happened yeah telephone Mm -hmm. yeah and then Macbeth is caught in this like cycle of monarch versus potential traitors potential treason so yeah so duncan like is so bad at telling who's going to be a traitor i know and and scotland at the time i was thinking about just how how ripe this fictional scotland was at the time for uh an uprising against duncan because yeah duncan was not living in a time where people were generally happy so uh there was a lot of unrest and if we look at like Shakespeare's time, there was a lot of unrest. If we looked at what happened uh, with the insurrection on January 6th, there has been a lot of unrest. All of these, all of these situations have political, economic, and social unrest in which leaders are kind of disconnected from what's actually happening. And it's like, uh, is it kind of inevitable, you know? Is it inevitable that Macbeth is going to, you know? Yeah. So Macbeth covers treason extensively yes and to open this topic up on a larger scale shakespeare does discuss tyranny and treason in uh his other plays and he comments on other ways that tyranny and treason manifest besides the uh uh the scaffold speeches and everything so i do just want to take a brief moment to talk about the medieval rudimentary system of checks and balances that was the law of the land for the medieval society that historical macbeth would have lived in And this check and balance could direct enforcement of basic rules against the sovereign himself. And the rules uh, explain and justify seemingly honorable nobles who rebel against a traitorous and tyrannical king. So if you were a knight, you were required to take a knight's oath and that forbade you from rising up against your sovereign. But in this time period, there was the acknowledgement that if you have a tyrant on the throne, there is reason enough to overthrow this king. And that is what the uh, Scottish Thanes do with the help of English allies to rid Scotland of tyrannical Macbeth. Um, and during Shakespeare's time, there is a check and balance on the sovereign. Sir Edward Cook, who was an English lawyer, argued that King James I was subject to a dual set of restraints, the Order of the Almighty and the Common Law, which of course James didn't like. Uh, so the point here is I think that Macbeth, the play Macbeth, is the incredible, unlawful tyrant who needs to be expelled from his position immediately. He is this absolute monstrous tyrant in an extreme way, 
And so the Scottish Danes have to rise against Macbeth in this extreme and violent way. Again, the check and balance of medieval society. And in contrast to his other plays that do discuss tyranny and treason, like the Henriad, the concepts that we're talking about here, the monstrous tyrants and treason against the crown, I think were uh, specific to a lot of the fears that were happening during Elizabethan and Jacobean England. Yeah. We know from other episodes just how much is in there for King James and that King James loved this play. But there are Mm. definitely times where theaters put on plays about treason that did not go so well. Mm. Tell me about it. There's this play that was lost to time. It was performed at least twice in December 1604. So right before we're about Mm -hmm. to get Macbeth, it was called Gowrie or The Gowrie Plot. (laughs) I found it twice with two different titles. Okay. It was about the Gowrie plot, which I mentioned earlier, where the Earl of Gowrie attempted to murder King James while he was sleeping over at the Earl's house. Sounds familiar. Sounds like a play <laughs> I've read. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And Gowrie was later linked to witchcraft. Yeah, he's the one uh he's the one I mentioned in the demonology episode who during his stay at Gowrie's, James thought that he saw a murderer with like demonic symbols all over his body Mm -hmm. so yeah same thing same guy yeah so this play about the gallery plot the king's men performed it at least twice but then it was banned and the script has been lost to time we don't even know who was the playwright for that okay we just know that they did produce a show about it and then it got got somehow banned Hmm. do we know exactly why it was banned or is that reason lost to history and you can just speculate Um, We can surmise the Crown didn't like depictions of treason, anything that would suggest, right? Like when we think about like that treason law, this treason statute, it's illegal to suggest that treason might be a good thing. So um, it was a little bit of like, "Hmm, too soon. Mm. But we also see like the Kingsmen or back then the Chamberlain's, the Lord Chamberlain's men got in trouble when they produced Richard II yeah. right before the Essex Rebellion, yep. right? They did. Yeah, it's surprising that they didn't actually get shut down from that. Uh, we covered a little bit in the intro series, so if you'd like to go back and hear a little bit about that, go back to, I believe it's part two. Um, it's Elizabethan theater. So um, at least by Macbeth, they either filled it with so much stuff that the monarch would enjoy instead or made the references so... Obscure, distant distant Mm -hmm. i think the problem with gallery was likely that it was literally about about the plot yeah it'd be like the king could go oh my goodness this reminds me of this thing in my life and they're you know confirming this thing and they'd be like oh no but it's fiction yeah exactly yeah it's Uh it's gallery literally being let's put the events of this treason on stage whereas macbeth is it'd be let's tell a story about someone who commits treason and then is condemned to hell yeah You know, we've talked about all the ways that the gunpowder plot, or many of the ways that the gunpowder plot, shows up in references Mm -hmm. in Macbeth. One more that I learned about in researching for this episode is the first stage direction of the play Macbeth talks about thunder and lightning. Yes. Thunder and lightning, the stage effect that would have been used, was created using either two processes— a rosin lighting flash, which was thrown into candles to create flares, or these things called squibs, which produced flashes and loud bangs. Uh, squibs were made out of a gunpowder. Mm. Mm-hmm. Gunpowder, especially at the time, is very bad smelling, and it smells worse after it's detonated. They're made out of sulfurous brimstone, uh. coal, and saltpeter. And saltpeter is made out of hog dung. <laughs> then, according to the manual for making stage effects of the time, it would then be compounded with the oil of eggs and put under hot, more hot dung. They love dung. So these two things were likely used to create thunder and lightning that starts the play Macbeth. Mm-hmm. The smell and the smoke would have lingered in the globe. Mm-hmm. And if performed in court, this would have been stifling. So... The idea of, like, the witches hovering through the fog and filthy air would likely be a reference to the fact that there is smoke and the smell of gunpowder in the air. Uh-huh. 
Paul being the dumbest smoke of hell could also be a reference to the actual olfactory experience. We don't know how the globe smelled in general, but we do know a few of the other theaters of the time were not the best smelling places. Mm. So add on top of that the Just actual the smell of gunpowder right after a plot that dealt with a lot of gunpowder and what would have happened had it exploded. Oh, it, yeah. And smell and memory weren't linked until centuries later. Mm -hmm. However, it was something that people were aware of in Elizabethan and Jacobian England. The smell of these effects could have made the recent memory of the gunpowder plot something very present in the minds of Shakespeare's audience while they watched the play mm -hmm. for the first few scenes. And by the early 1600s, gunpowder had been used in theater to help represent hell. There's lots of records of expenditures from medieval dramas that include loads and loads of gunpowder. And in one play specifically, a stage direction explicitly says that gunpowder, and I'm going to mispronounce this word, I think it's pips, but it's P-Y-P-Y-S, mm -hmm. Mm. and pipes are sported oh. by a devil character in his hands, ears, and rear end. <laughs> of course. <laughs> kind of like the porter uh, referencing this medieval char stock character, and we also get in that scene the like south door entrance mm -hmm. of a Christ-like figure, which would come from medieval times. The use of gunpowder is a thing that would simultaneously remind audiences of recent events while being rooted in centuries-old theatrical practices. Well, and here's something, too, for my reading. Uh, it makes a lot of sense that the witches would be present for the beginning of this play due to, you know, the devil lore. Um, according to William Perkins, who was post-Reformation, he said a witch was, quote, the most notorious traitor and rebel that can be, unquote. So you have these treacherous, traitorous beings in the beginning with this very visceral stage effect that has a very strong connection to hell, you know? And uh, it's, yeah. Yeah. If you're living in the time period and you know these things, you're picking up the pieces and putting them together because it's common knowledge. So it's more like SNL making a bunch of references mm -hmm. to go back to Duncan being bad at telling Sniffing who's good out. and who's not. Yeah, he can't sniff them out. He says that Dunsinane smells heavenly right after Lady Macbeth invites the dumbest smoke of hell into the castle. And like castles tended to smell of gunpowder anyway because they were mostly used for defense mm. and battle and also at that point in the play it's really unlikely that the smell of those special effects had dissipated smell was also linked with morality mm. sin smelled bad virtue smelled good mm -hmm. so duncan is going this place smells great the audience is like no, no we still are like stinks. dealing with this gunpowder yeah yeah no that's a wild absolutely wild explanation full circle of everything that i I would never have picked that up if I was just reading or seeing that that's so outside of like any modern readings, so distant from right. it. Yeah. And then you say that and it's like. But it's literally like a national almost crisis mm -hmm. involving gunpowder. And that's the. Your king, all the lords, your entire seat of government was almost. Killed. Overthrown. Yeah. Killed because of gunpowder. Killed. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the theater and the first the thing, the star of the show, is the overwhelming smell of gunpowder. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm convinced that, like, the first act is, like, filled with indicators of what's to come, you know? Like, we talked about in gender politics where you have these ambiguous witches, these weird sisters, and it's just something that's not expected in a play of the time. And then you also have, like, the smell of gunpowder, the memory, the, you know, <sighs> oh, Shakespeare. Yeah. He's just full of, like, let me get them where they least expect it. Yeah, some really great production thought. And of course, he could not have thought of it. So whoever was associated with it. Wh whoever decided to put that element in there. Round of applause. Wow. Mm -hmm. Round of applause. That's cool. I kind of want to play to like, well, I wouldn't actually want this if I went to the theater, but I kind of want a production of Macbeth to be like, let's make the lobby smell like gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> let's just really get them on board with the fact that bad things are going to happen. Yeah. It just smells of, like, sulfur in here. Ugh, gross. And I think that about wraps up our discussion. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk at you next time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk at you, you next so time. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. 
This is Shakespeare Anyone? Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From All's Well That Ends Well, Act 2, Scene 1, Spoken by King. Now, good LeFou, bring in the admiration that we with thee may spend our wonder to or take thine by wondering how thou tookst it.